evening. My name is Alessandra Moctezuma and I'm the gallery director here at San Diego Mesa College. And I welcome everybody to this simple night. Um, I am very happy to have the opportunity to introduce the curator of our exhibition, Beata Berman N. Um, she is our amazing art history professor. She's been teaching at Mesa and actually just re retired last fall, but you know, she decided she wanted to uh, organize and curate an exhibition for us here at the gallery. And, and she had, had her own gallery in Los Angeles years ago, so she had connections with all these wonderful artists. Um, and so this show came together also with, um, with some contributions from one of the artists. Um, I'm not gonna take too long, I just wanna thank uh, our students. Um, we have our museum studies program here. Our museum studies classes actually help us put together the exhibitions. They do everything from hanging the exhibit, doing the lighting, helping us with designing the catalog. And of course, um, I wanna thank uh, Pat Vine, who usually never makes it out here because she's busy over there in the gallery, but she's my gallery coordinator and she's incredible. And also all our gallery assistants, Jacqueline Sarvis, Orisa Barua, um, and Erica uh, Johnson, who actually designed the catalog. So I just wanna say that this show wouldn't be that beautiful if I hadn't such a wonderful team that works together. So without any further ado, here's uh, Beata Bermanin. I, all I can do is second that notion. Without all that wonderful help, it wouldn't have come together. And it's always the museum studies class that, that do the final touches. So that's very, very wonderful to have so many helping hands. Uh, I remember from my gallery time, I didn't have that. It was always me you know, who did everything, the painting and everything. I mean, walls, not the images. <laughs> okay, well, let me start by you know, I'm an art historian, by giving you an art history lecture. <laughs> uh, the card, The Seven Deadly Sins here, which you see and which you all got, was actually inspired by the table of The Seven Deadly Sins that was painted by um, Hieronymus Bosch uh, many, many years ago in the 15th century. And in those days, the concept of the seven deadly sins was, of course, very much current. Everybody believed in it fervently and dreaded them and dreaded the punishment for the seven deadly sins. Now, you might wonder, you know, why is this still up to date today? You know, not so many people go to church and believe in what the priests or the uh, reverends are telling us. So let's go a little bit into the history of the seven deadly sins because most people really assume that they are found in the Bible, you know, just like the Ten Commandments are found in the, in the Bible. And so, uh, you know, we really don't question them today and nobody really has the time to research them. Well, this is not so. There were no seven deadly sins as such listed in the Bible. Uh, there are many places where sins are referred to, of course. And, uh, you know, being a professor at Mesa College, uh, it's sort of like uh, student learning outcomes. You know, you think, uh, you know, aren't the grades enough? So aren't the Ten Commandments enough? And in a way, yes, they are. But the church, you know, this is the Catholic Church, they found it very necessary to really lay it out. So where is anything found? Well, we can start with the Proverbs of King Solomon. And you see uh, one of the places there he talks about is the six things that the Lord hates and seven that his soul detests. But he puts in a couple of things that we wouldn't consider to be deadly sins, you know. So, uh, you know, feet that are swift to run into mischief. Well, you know, maybe that's just unfortunate. <laughs> or uh, him that sows discord amongst brethren. So you see, there was quite a spread in what was considered to be thin things that the Lord hates, and they have then become uh, the deadly sins. It got a little bit more precise, uh, and this was written down in a letter by the Apostle Paul uh, to the various congregations that they founded along the edges of the Mediterranean. And uh, you know the, the apostles went there to spread the gospel, but then they left to go to the next town. And they wanted to keep in contact with those new converts. And so what uh, they did is they kept on writing letters to them. It's like a how-to, you know, this is what you should do and this is what you shouldn't do. So Paul writes this one here, and he his list is longer, you know, than the seven. And he adds, you know, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness. 
uncleanliness, think of that. Idolatry, you know, they were very careful, you know, these are the early days of Christianity to make people turn away from paganism. Sorcery, you know, same sort of thing. Hatred, hatred as a sin, what do you think of that? Variance, I don't know what that means and what Paul meant by variance. Emulation is also a little bit mysterious, but wrath and strife, you know, that's anger and you should be humble and you should be patient and you shouldn't do that. Uh, sedition, I hear we get political, right? But again, we don't know what Paul exactly meant by sedition. Heresies, envyings, you know, envy is one of the sins. Murder, of course, you know, Ten Commandments. Drunkenness, mm, huh? <laughs> revelings, and such like. Though here he sort of gave up and said, and there are others, you know, I just don't want to name them all. Okay? So that was in the first century AD. Now, you know, this was a long version and people were sort of, you know, mm, you know it, it needed to be a little bit more concise. So we have a monk in the fourth century. So now we have progressed over three centuries. Uh, his name was Eva Evagrius Ponticus. And he uh, summons it up as evil thoughts. Okay, now here we have a thought control, right? No, don't think so. Uh, don't think evil. And gluttony, of course, we have in the, in the final list as well. Prostitution and fornication, well, that would be under lust. Uh, avarice, you know, that's greed. Um, hubris. That's a Greek word, and he wrote these things all down in Greek. And we do use, uh, well, we academics, you know, we use the word hubris a lot, uh, meaning, you know, excessive pride, you know, really being very, very proud of uh, what you have, what you do, and so on. And the church, of course, frowns upon that because the church wants you to be humble and not prideful. Okay, so he adds hubris, and that was, you know, now rendered as pride, but it also meant self-esteem in the Greek. You know, there's a meaning for that word that means self-esteem. Now, we would not consider that a sin, would we? You know, self-esteem is something we try to encourage in children, you know, uh, be proud of yourself. So, you know, we're treading a very thin path here. Sadness, sadness. Okay, he added that. Now, why shouldn't you be sad? Well, this is, you know, Christian thinking. You should be glad in the Lord, and the Lord will help you in everything. So if you're sad, you're not trusting in the Lord. That's where that comes from. Uh, and so sadness as envy, sadness of another's good fortune. Wrath, of course, and boasting. Oops, I got that twice. And dejection and sloth. Now, dejection, that's when you, again, you know, when you don't trust in the Lord, you know, helping you along, and uh, you get discouraged, and you don't pluck up your courage, and you sit there dejected and do nothing. And that leads to sloth, of course, and then it's a sin. Okay, so there's a long path, you know, to get to our seven deadly sins. And, you know, this was refined and refined. And eventually we have in the sixth century, uh, Pope Gregory, very famous Pope, and he gave it the final form. And then Dante Alighieri, our Renaissance poet who wrote the Divine Comedy, he picked that up. And when he describes the, his descent into purgatory, he encounters the seven deadly sins, gives each one a circle. And he uses the definitions of uh, Gregory. And uh, what he did to shorten them even further is he folded the ideas of sorrow, despair, despondency, and um, you know, into sloth, asedia in Latin. Okay? And then vainglory, which was used formally very often. We don't use that word anymore, vainglory. But he just summed that up into pride. And so now here we have them, all our seven deadly sins, with a Latin uh, next to it, because uh, when Hieronymus Bosch painted his table, he used the Latin words. Okay? And, uh, uh, um, and you will see Mariana de la Rosa's work uses, she uses Spanish titles, and they're, of course, extremely close to the Latin, so you know, you'll recognize them. Now, the church, of course, to make it clear, and theologians are like that, you know, they explain everything over and over and over again. And uh, they wanted you to kind of see the correspondence between the sins and the remedy that the church has, or rather the other suggestion that comes from the church for the uh, Christian believer. So pride is combated with humility, lust with chastity, gluttony with temperance, greed with charity. <laughs> Uh, sloth, of course, was diligence, and wrath was patience, and envy was kindness. Okay, those are the opposing. So those are the virtues, and those are the vices. You know, they like these correspondences very much. 
Why would we still be interested in this, right? This is like old <laughs> history, and uh, you know why why bother with this today? Well, if you spend your time, as I know many of our students do, uh, browsing the internet and you put in the seven deadly sins, boy, you can spend hours and hours and hours coming with results. There are fashion designers who design the seven deadly sins in, in various fashion uh, exploits. Uh, Bob Dylan wrote a song called Seven Deadly Sins. Uh, there is a ballet by Balanchine that's the Seven Deadly Sins. It's based actually on a on a Brecht uh, opera, and uh, but it, it uses that idea of the Seven Deadly Sins. And here we have contemporary artists from um, some from San Diego and from the rest of the country, also indulging <laughs> in in this theme and thinking about it and coming up with their own very very private solutions. Uh, well, not private, but very individual solutions to this. Okay, so I'll start out with Phyllis Davidson. Phyllis is actually the one who uh, uh, asked me to curate the show. Uh, she had this idea for it, and she had been already working, uh, you know, since 2010 and earlier uh, on uh, works that could be put and some especially made for the show, you know, into this theme of the Seven Deadly Sins. Uh, Phyllis has, an, you know, all of our artists here have, an, uh, almost all, an endlessly long, no, all of them, a long list of, on their resume of the shows that they've had all over the country, solo shows, group shows, and so on. So they're all experienced, fine artists. Some of them are uh, professors, so, uh, you know, you really get a very accomplished, uh, not emerging artists, but really artists who've done their, their craft for a long, long time. Now, what I usually get when Phyllis Phyllis Davidson's work come up as people want to uh, say that uh, Phyllis uses airbrush. She doesn't, and she gets very angry when people say that because hers is really the old-fashioned oil on canvas method, you know, carefully planned out, carefully laid out compositions, and so on. And in this one here, uh, insatiable, uh, you see, you know, a tableau, and I'll just put in a few. Um, preparatory studies here. You know, for the hand, Phyllis used her own hand and, uh, you know, drew it uh, carefully probably numerous times before she uh, hit onto the final one. Uh, the, the face of the maid up here, you know, with her hat also very, very carefully laid out and uh, researched. And then, I don't know, Phyllis, if, <laughs> if you had all those, fruit, uh, all those desserts available to you, but they are very, very realistic and, you know, really glossily and beautifully and succulently painted, you know, really want to get in there. Uh, so, you know, what she really does with this work is she gets out as our gluttonous selves, you know, we all like sweets sometimes and so on and so forth. But then she adds, and many of these artists do that, they're not, they're not totally specific to just one sin, they add, you know, uh, uh, others into it as well. So, you know, I can see a bit of lust here in the background, you know, so there, there is a mixture of various sins in this. So here, oh, I always like the, when I ask Phyllis about the nipples here, those are actually chocolate pasties that you can buy. <laughs> uh, of course, I don't know what you would do with them, but. <laughs> the old concept of the hell wagon, this was something that was used in medieval uh, plays. Uh, you may have, you may know that in front of the various cathedrals, there's usually a big, big plaza, and uh, it was customary in the Middle Ages to have plays in front of it that the church approved of. They were like, you know, like in Oberammergau when they do the Easter plays, you know, the Passion of Christ. A very serious stuff. Um, they're really to illuminate the teachings of the church. And so the hell wagon uh, were produced to, uh, you know, show you what horrible things might happen uh, if you indulge in these various sins. So Phyllis uses this idea, and you know, it's it's some. You may not even, you know carried away by that lovely derriere, you may not even know that this all is happening in the demons or gargoyles or devils, huge open mouths, you know. So so our, um, it's called School for Angels, and maybe uh, Phyllis will explain uh, that later on, but it is, you know, a, a very seductive looking trio here sitting in this hell wagon. So of course, you know, the multiplicity of sins, it can allude to uh, lust as well. And I'm sure you all saw the other images in the gallery. This one here, Winner Takes All, is of course greed. 
you know, and we have this smug, self-sufficient, you know, Wall Street dealer sitting there, uh, not realizing at all that he is sitting in the hell wagon, you know, that he's already in hell, you know. So it's, uh, in a way, it's sort of an indictment of the sin of greed. And uh, we have, you know, our good old Santa Claus. Now, why would he be uh, part of greed? Uh, i let you answer that yourself, for yourself. And... Uh, uh, in this one here, the skeleton at the feast is again, you know, a combination of uh, various sins. Now, I, it struck me when I saw the various images, you know, from the different artists, that almost all of them have a bit of surrealism in their work. You know, and that, that's a, that was fascinating to me. Um, you know, they come from different areas, they use different media, and, and yet surrealism seems to be the connecting thread between all of these works. Marianella de la Hoz is a uh, San Diego artist, and uh, she does these exquisite, wonderful, delightful miniatures. Now, you can see right away the, the problems that art historians and teachers get into it. You know, when I talk about these works, they all are huge uh, on a screen, right? Sometimes I ask the students, you know, what's the material, and then some wise guy will pipe up and I always hope for that, and say, oh, light on a screen. That's what it is. It's light on the screen, right? But the real work, the original work, is the old-fashioned egg tempera on panel. That's the method that the proto-Renaissance artists used, that the, they used still during the Renaissance, the early Renaissance, and then eventually they gave it up for oil on canvas. Well, what, the, what that is, is powdered pigments, and you get them from various sources, uh, a beautiful deep blue that was used by artists who could afford it was lapis lazuli, semi-precious stone. They smash with a hammer until it's really powder, like face powder. And then you take your dry pigments. Uh, some are much cheaper. You know, all the brown tones are earth. You know, you just pick up a handful of sand and, and do the same thing. But you mix it with egg yolk and a bit of distilled water. And that's the reason why these, when you look in the gallery at the actual works, they have this lovely golden glow to it very often. And that comes from the egg yolk. Okay? Uh, earlier artists used egg white. You can use that too. It makes a nice binder. But egg white dries very brittle, and so it has a tendency to crack. You know, the yolk has a lot of fat in it. You know, that's why when you're on a diet, you're not supposed to eat the yolk, only the bites. But, you know, egg yolk makes just a great, great binder. Uh, it still dries relatively quickly, and that's why uh, in the high renaissance they substituted the egg binder with oil. The oil dries much slower, which allows the artist to fiddle around with the paint, and you can also use bigger brushes. With the egg tempera, you use very fine brushes. It's almost like a mini well, it is a miniature painting, you know. So they don't really lend themselves easily to large uh, scale paintings, even though artists did that as well. So I'm going to go through a couple of Maria Nella's works here. Uh, by the way, Maria Nella has an upcoming show in the San Diego Museum of Art, so she has arrived even in the museum circles, like you know many of our artists have. So this one here is El Seductor. Do I say that right? <laughs> okay. And uh, to me, that was like the instigator of all the sins. That's the devil. Right, is, you know, very plainly visible. And later on, I'll, I'll show you another interpretation of, uh, you know, that instigator of the sins. Uh, avarice and wrath, you know. Avarice, again, you know, Marianella, I don't really know why you, why, why you composed it that way, and you can tell us about that a little later. So, ira, you know, that's a Latin word, the same in, in Spanish and in Latin. Ira is wrath, anger. And you know the voodoo doll was the was the heart uh, pricked you know in anger and the person you know rending his hair her hair so she right yeah uh, in anger so definitely no patience you know no patience you know doing what uh, you know your your passion and this time wrathful passion uh, tells you to do. And Gula here, that's a very meditative one, a very different take on uh, gluttony than what Phyllis's uh, works had. You know, here we have the man almost contemplating leisurely, uh, you know, the, the food in front of him. And it's not really my idea of a glutton because, you know, uh, Marianella chose not to make him excessively fat, but he's a sort of, uh, you know, a slender person. But glutton 
destiny is sort of uh, excessive uh, need or greed for food or anything really. And in the earlier list you saw that, that gluttony as such was sometimes uh, added as a sort of a sin of, um, you know, acquisitiveness, you know, like avarice, you know, you want more, 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 whether you need it or not. And so this is a very enigmatic, you know, like a riddle, uh, especially once you discover there's a man on the plate. Luhuria is the luxury, and that was the old word for um, lust. And envidia is envy, and I kind of like this one because, you know, as a painter, uh, you always try to do, you know, the best you can. And of course, the, the goal is to be regarded as highly as, you know, in this case, Leonardo da Vinci or, you know, Caravaggio or somebody you really truly admire who hangs in the museum. And here the artist, you know, obviously very dissatisfied <coughs> with, with her own achievements, paints out in anger, you know, the famous Mona Lisa. When I asked my students in the very the first lecture of my art history classes you know what what artwork can you think of right off the bat you know what comes to mind and there's always a number of students who, who say Mona Lisa why is she so famous well you know the, we, we don't want to answer that here but you know the fame is just totally pervasive and so the anger that an artist directs at somebody who has this very very famous work and we don't really know why you know it's a portrait of a plump woman with no eyebrows and uh, you know she doesn't look very intelligent you know why is she so famous she's not even slim you know so you know all of this can spark our anger when we see that man is so admired that people know nothing else but they know the Mona Lisa you know why is that so so that's the image that Marianella uh, chose for uh, envy and the last one is laziness la pereza and uh, this is pride okay so pride is uh, you know, looking at yourself, being proud, and in this case, of course, the wonderful physique of that man. And uh, uh, very, very uh, telling is, or rather, you know, I, I take it as very telling, that pride, you know, really is pride in the moment, what you have now. There really is no regard for the future or the past. And so he, of course, disregards the fact that, you know, that beauty of body will go away, you know, and there's a grave in the end. Okay, so pride, as we all know, cometh before the fall, the Bible tells us. So No, I don't know if the Bible does. Now, pride will hook us in into Henning van Berg's work. He's a photographer, he is German, he obviously couldn't make it here today, uh, but too much. Uh, and he also uses for pride the image of a man in his full glory, you know, very, uh, you know, very well endowed and uh, muscular and just, you know, but he doesn't look into the mirror as Marianella's man does, and uh, and yet you know there is this kind of uh, you know showing off his physique and being very proud of him. Now both of these artists use a man in his prime, you know, as the image for pride. And I put very tiny down below uh, uh, Hieronymus Bosch, and it was much more common in the olden days that they used the female as prideful and vain, you know, the vain, the vanity of the woman, uh, and she looks in the mirror of course you know as uh, Marianella's man does and uh, in in this tiny little this is from the uh, table of the seven deadly sins uh, there's a devil right there behind the cupboard you know she looks in the mirror and of course in those days mirrors were very small and the devil is right there because he knows that's a sin vanity you know so so it has changed you know in at least in these two artists from being a female into a male you know that's the exponent of pride Henning's lust here is a very, very interesting image. You know, usually lust, you have, you know, the two men and women, you know, engaged in various activities. But here we have the, the woman, sort of like a devil, in the front and uh, uh, kind of hoarding uh, the men in the back. And at first, when I saw this as a small image, I thought they were tied, you know, shackled, but they're not. You know, they're standing willingly, you know, with their back to the viewer, in this horrible contraption, you know, which I'm sure he found in some factory. And, and she is, you know, in her glory, uh, nude except for the stockings and the high heels, um, not engaged with the men. You know, so the uh, hint is, and to me it's very obvious, there's no love involved. You know, there's no real attachment between male and female. It's, you know, it's just lust and that's it, you know, and she, she kind of keeps her 
uh, objects, and they're really objects, they're not uh, people that she is concerned with. And then, of course, you know, the fiery mouse of hell right there, but <coughs> Henning puts it into a factory kind of setting. So we have the factory in the background, you know, standing for hell. The other two images are much more, uh, you know, enigmatic again. And meditation is more like, you know, the, the sinner contemplating uh, the dichotomy between uh, sin and the church and the church's teaching. And uh, when you saw the image in the gallery, it's a very pristine, very stark, very beautiful image, I think. And uh, the cowering figure in the front of the altar, you know, really makes that like, you know, the church is clean, the church is pristine, it's orderly, it's there, and here's the sinner at the altar, you know, contemplating. And and of course, you know, from the attitude and the way he's crouching, uh, Henning tells us that, you know, the sinner is, uh, you know, overwhelmed by the rigidity, the crispness, the cleanliness uh, of the doctrine, really, you know, of the church. Uh, the desert angel, uh, to me, that's a very nice image because um, it, it uh, leads back to Lucifer. Many of the churchmen said that pride is the, major, is, is the first sin. You know, too much pride leads to all the other sins. You know, and, uh, and Lucifer was the angel that in his pride wanted to be like God. And so he was cast out from heaven. So we still have the beautiful angel. You know, he's still a very wonderful specimen of a man, well, of an angel, but he has black wings. You know, and, and uh, you know, his attitude is, is sort of, you know, he's not in heaven anymore. It's very, very subtle. And uh, I think it, it, it fits. Now, so Henning is a photographer. <clears throat> and from photography, uh, well, let me just compare the two. You know, so the devil here, you know, Lucifer in Henning van Berg's image uh, is, is this, you know, still free, still surrounded by light, you know, having perhaps just descended from heaven. And Marianella already has him in the black surrounding, you know, totally uh, dark environment with the panther uh, in the back and the snake coming out of his sleeve, you know. So there, there's the descent has been completed uh, in these two. <clears throat> well, in that one. So you see already we have a number of different media that are being used. We had oil on canvas, we have photography, and this one is a printmaker, Jean Flores, a printmaker. And uh, he, uh, does, he gives us a number of uh, print methods in which um, uh, our printmaker was here, but he isn't. Uh, the envy image here is an etching, I believe, a uh, bit of to me, an enigma. I wish he was here and could explain it. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure how that is to be read, but this is good. You know, it leaves every viewer open to make up your own mind about that. Whereas greed is is a wonderful historical illusion. I think uh, he makes the uh, image on the horse like a conquistador, and the image on the ground uh, with the feather headdress and so on, uh, Aztec, Mayan, you know, South American uh, native, and as we all know. Oh, you know, the conquistadores really uh, exhibited a huge amount of greed in the way they treated the uh, native population of South America and, uh, you know, all the things that they did. And uh, this, of course, is meant to be a helmet, but uh, he makes it like a shark, mm -hmm. you know, and shark, you know, with their endless feeding, uh, you know, very, very good choice. And uh, the other thing that I found very interesting is that the spear that he gives his conquistador is actually a cross. Mm -hmm. You know, he uses it as a spear, but it's a cross. And that, of course, is how the conquistadores, uh, you know, felt justified in wreaking havoc on the native uh, population by bringing the scriptures to the natives. You know, that was a big conviction. Uh, lust is very surrealistic. You know, it can't get much more surrealistic than this one here. And, uh, you know, the, the alteration of the figure and the half female, I mean, to me, the face here looks rather male, but there was the breast, of course, it's female. And then these, these figures that emerge from the ground and uh, lust after the nipples. Uh, and uh, he holds in one of his leg arms, arm legs, uh, a cigarette. And the cigarette is this sort of black smoke that is filled with sinful 
beautiful figures that come out, you know, of the cigarette. So you have all kinds of wonderful, uh, you know, images fused into one. And uh, I don't know, uh, you're probably many of you too young, but in uh, the Yellow Submarine, there was a, an image of these black holes opening and things popping out and down and up above. And so I'm, I really like these these holes in the ground. You know, to me, they lead to another world. You know, but you know, you have your own imagination. Uh, and then there's the heart. You know, this is an image for lust, okay? So if there's true passion, true love, you know, the heart is involved. And here the heart is away from the body. It's out of the body. It's not in the body anymore. And uh, it is broken and has the same kind of smoke coming out of the broken heart, you know, or, or ripped open heart or however you want to see that. So, and, and the flies, flies usually are associated with the devil and with sin. So the big black fly here is buzzing at his head. Nice image. Uh, gluttony, you know, pretty obvious. Don't have to say much about that. <laughs> you know, using, uh, well, no, I don't want to say anything about that, but it's, it's a wonderful <laughs> image. <laughs> and uh, most of his are etchings that are hand colored afterwards. You know, there was one that was a serigraph. So, uh, pride. Uh, again, you know, you can uh, contrast that with the other prides. Here it's a very, very strange surrealistic image of pride, you know, where, uh, you know, the, the ideal is in the mirror, but it's not the woman who looks at the mirror. And then various things uh, that, you know, like we, we see the needles here and we think of Botox and you see the scissors, you know, who cut away what isn't pleasing, you know, to achieve this image that we have to be pride well, she has, to be proud of herself and prideful, you know, which is a sin. Uh, here again, I would love to have Jean's explanation uh, for sloth. Uh, so I must leave it to you to make your own explanation for that one. Artists like to do that, you know, they like to leave uh, things open for the viewer to get, put in their uh, interpretations. This one here is Ross, and here we have the old-fashioned method of a woodcut. Uh, you know, the, the same method applies to lino cuts, it's the same idea. You do pretty broad uh, slashes into your flat material and you gouge out whatever is black on the surface. So anything that you see black here, that is the original surface. Everything that you see white is white paper. Uh, when I saw this, you know, the inveterate art historian in me, I thought immediately of Goya's uh, images of the horrors of war. You know, when he did his series, there is one in there that shows a tortured, mutilated, uh, you know, a dismembered figure on a tree. And that to me is the same. But here, well, I mean, very close inspiration. But here he puts in these, these hooded figures, you know, who remind us of the Ku Klux Klan, even though here the hoods are black and the eyes are uh, white, you know, it's the reverse. But uh, the same image of horror and uh, anger and uncontrolled uh, wrath, you know, being uh, put forward here by Jean Flores. <clears throat> Alexa Makarian is another one of our San Diego artists. Uh, when I saw this image at first, I said, wow, that is not the way Alexia usually paints. And it is, but she's a very, very versatile artist. Again, with many, many shows in San Diego. Uh, one that I remember with great pleasure was in uh, the, um, the, the Taylor Library, uh, close to Oceanside. In, no, Ocean Beach, Ocean Beach. But what Alexia did is, uh, she is for a long time already interested in uh, how we handle religion in the various religions. She comes from a background where she was very familiar uh, with uh, the Russian Orthodox uh, in, from the neighborhood she grew up. But you know, Catholic uh, usages of, for example, Milagros uh, and votive images. And this one here is a votive image. The original was a tiny little thing, uh, a little photograph that uh, you, you are given in the church you know, at, at some occasions. So Alexia took this image and then she added things to it and, and altered it, of course, and then uh, put it together in that wonderful inverted pyramid that you saw in the uh, gallery. Now, what does she do usually? Well, she does uh, paintings of this sort. Uh, those are the ones I are familiar with. Uh, the Hamilton Beach uh, Folly, you know, refers to the blender up here. And then these 
images are you know beautiful surfaces you can kind of get lost in the various uh, raises and smoothnesses and so on reflective uh, surfaces and she has a very special way of dealing with figures you know from the original ones which are almost photorealistic uh, she you know goes into very abstracted altered images so you know that that's a bit of a background but what you see here in the gallery uh, is the image of the Madonna uh, you know who's a wonderful you know sort of 19th century smooth clean white Madonna in that voluminous uh, blue cloak with a white undergarment the older tradition was to close the Mary figure in pink or in red undergarment and then the blue cloak of heaven so here we have a white one and uh, you know the various images here until we come to number seven which has hell inverted you know with the arrow pointed the other way um, is the Madonna contemplating and we don't quite know what she's contemplating but we assume it's the seven deadly sins in human beings and what leads them to them. and you can see that in the original ex voto there are tears coming out of the Madonna's eyes and in the last one here uh, Alexia turned them into hearts you know it's like the compassion of the Madonna flowing out like tears you know for the human beings and I love this little finger <laughs> <laughs> There's a tiny little finger coming out as she wraps herself in the long sleeves, you know, of her cloak. And, you know, you notice that the image, the face of the Madonna in this original ex photo, which is probably anonymous, you know, usually you don't know who made that original image. But it's a very classical, very smooth, very ethereal image. You know, that long, thin nose, which is in the Byzantine tradition, you know, the very long, straight, thin nose. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a very, very clean, very smooth, very compassionate. Uh, Madonna who looks down. Now, where did Alexia get these uh, markings from? Well, they are, uh, you know, what we call diacritical marks, and you, you can buy them, uh, uh, you know, as stick on, uh, you know, like accent aigus and accent graves and, and quotes and what have you. And so using those uh, ready-made marks and putting them on there, you know, gives us the idea, like in one of them, uh, it looks very much like a tattoo. Where is it? Um, Ah, this one here, uh, you know, as if the Madonna is tattooed. In others, it's sort of like the thoughts that emanate from her head and so on. So uh, very, very imaginative, very creative, you know, to give all these hints without being really explicit about, you know, which sin in it is it, what is she actually contemplating, and yet, you know, it really speaks to the theme. Uh, Peter Zokowski, who uh, I believe lives in uh, Long Beach, and uh, he only has two works in the show here. And uh, this one here, The Two Women, is his take on pride. Okay? And what we have here is, you know, again, the old oil on canvas method, and they're really quite traditional in their execution, but beautifully done. He has a great sense of color, you know, the way he blends the various colors into each other. And he has two women. Uh, which to us look almost identical, you know, in form and shape and so on. One is an albino, so that's why she is uh, very light skinned, and she's being contemplated by the dark pigmented woman. And the dark pigmented one is uh, not very different, except that she has a tiny little belt, right? That's the only clothing she wears. And yet there's this expression of haughtiness in her, uh, which points to the fact that. Pride can be based really on nothing. You know, you can be prideful and superior, or feeling prideful and superior to somebody uh, with not much justification. You know, that's not taking the other's worth into account. And that's why the church, you know, doesn't like it, because you should be humble and you should contemplate, you know, other people's worth as well and be charitable to them, etc., etc. So it's a very, very subtle take on pride. You know, you compare that to the other examples, you know, that you've seen, and it's a, it's a much more, um, you know, there's underlying pride, and it's much more subtle, but beautifully painted. The other work uh, is called Tiger Goddess, and this one refers to sloth. Now, that again is not very clear, you know, it's not very obvious that this should be sloth, but what Zukovsky refers to is the tradition that when women in India went into the jungle to gather wood, uh, tigers were abound, 
around, but tigers don't attack you uh, if you confront them, so the belief was. Uh, and so when you go and bend down, of course, your face is down, the tiger can't see, and so it jumps at you. And so what they did is they wear a mask on the back of their head so that the tiger thinks you're looking at them and you're confronting them even though you're not. You're walking away from the tiger. So the mask here lies discarded on the floor. There it is. You know, so she has neglected, and that's where our sloths, you know, do nothing, the duty of putting the mask on her, on her back of her head uh, to prevent this attack from the tiger. And yet, you know, here's a tiger goddess that is being worshipped. So the riddle is here, you know, how to puzzle this all out. You know, he hasn't given us all that many clues in this image. But it does refer, you know, to neglecting your duty, not doing what you're supposed to be doing, and then getting the punishment in uh, the form of the tiger. Uh, Doug Sutherland is our artist who does a multimedia combination of things. And... Uh, uh, I'm not a multimedia person, so I can't really talk about that at all. But what I can talk about is that this, this installation, which is well in the gallery on one of the walls, uh, makes reference to a very famous um, a late uh, Renaissance work by Matthias Grunewald, uh, The Crucifixion. And uh, if, you, if you know that work, you know that the Christ on the cross is one of the most horrifying Christs ever painted. I mean, Grunewald really paints him with decaying flesh, blue lips, horrible thorns in his body, a very, very nasty crown of thorns, it's, and you know, contorted fingers on the cross. It's really the most horrifying image of Christ on the cross that I know. And he takes that away, and he substitutes it with our with the Robo Christ, and uh, the figures around uh, the cross they are taken directly, you know, verbatim, uh, Photoshop, no doubt, uh, from uh, the Grunewald image. Whereas the two sinners up here, he added from another artist, Baldon Green. Of course, Grunewald didn't add the, the two other crosses there. He wanted just Christ there and nothing else. So it's a wonderful reference to art history, <laughs> which of course I appreciate, uh, and then putting it together in a really, really contemporary setting. Uh, and the other works here uh, of uh, Sutherland's, you know, are in the same vein, uh, and, you know, he will talk to you about that. And then the storyboards refer to uh, how carefully, like Phyllis Davidson, you know, you have to lay everything out and plan it, you know, until you come to your final work and to your final conclusion. And with those lovely words, I conclude. Thank you very much. <laughs> now I would, like, I would like our artists to come up front here and answer questions from the floor. And we'll have Doug first talk about his work, because I don't, I don't really know much to say about it. I guess um, the easiest way to, I don't want to, I could go on and on, but. Um, oh, just a little. <laughs> but I'll, I'll make it pretty brief. The, the real impetus behind it, or the, the inspiration, is actually some published lectures by the, um, he was a social critic for the New Yorker, Lewis Mumford. Ah, yes. And one of the things that seems to run through, it's a, it's a little thin publication called uh, Art and Techniques, or Art and Techniques. Mm -hmm. And his, kind of his focus in that was that through the culture, or not, the Industrial Revolution, we, as a society, and even back then, he talks about this brilliant young architect. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright. So Frank Lloyd Wright is not a very young architect any longer, but that kind of dates it. But he talks about how society was losing our, its spiritual center through its worship of technology, then just out, you know freshly out of the Industrial Revolution. So, and I've always had this fascination, and I've used a lot of art historical references in my work. So it just seems sort of a, a logical progression based on that to make the worship object the machine. And today, with, you know, with games and with uh, all the technology that's become such a part of our lives, especially these darn things, <laughs> um, uh, it's, even more, it's even more of a case. And you know, I, I teach at a, a medium-sized university in Florida, and it's getting harder and harder to keep people from not focusing on their phones and focusing on well, their education now. So it's really become more and more of that. And then I thought, well, what this, this kind of logical progression was, what would I, where would I take it from there? And I teach animation, so I needed it to become an animation, just to kind of play into the scholarship there, thing there. But, um, and I thought, you know, based on those bumper stickers, um, WWJ, 
DS? I thought of WWRCS, what would, G, what would RoboChrist say? And, and he'd be pissed. You know, he came back in second company, coming in, and he came back in, in this uh, manifestation. He'd be really pissed at the um, appropriation of what his, his doctrines had become. So it kind of, and, and the, the whole, sort of whole abuse of power, and the, the abuse of power through the lust of power, and how that's kind of become a big part of, of our, our society. And as, as I was listening to your lecture, that's the one thing that I kept thinking about was that um, not only has it become an issue, but it's, we almost admire people in our society today more who play into the deadly sins than mm -hmm. we, people who avoid them. That, that, that sin has become a virtue, and virtues have become things that dumb people do. And, you know, the storyboarding's towards, and I finally got that, you know, this was a real uh, inspiration to get something done because it's, it's a, trying to do the animation pretty much on my, on my lonesome, where you're usually done by large teams uh, and large studios over years to do something. It was really nice to get something to a finish point and get it in the show. So the storyboards are, are for the final animation. So that's, and then because I have to have stuff as I go through the process, I do all these kind of things. The storyboards, the drawings, the, the little Mac cats, the, the mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, Anella, do you want to say anything about yours? And in this one, I, I would like to say that this is a reference and a critique to the Catholic priest. This is a priest. Ah. And of course, it's not a man, it's a young boy in the plate. Mm -hmm. So oh. that's a direct reference to you know what. So <laughs> that's my opinion. And that's Glockish. Yeah. Uh -huh. huh? Yes. It ties into the whole thing with we, we, we usurp, off, usurp so much power to these people that we, and so much responsibility to these people that are, we look up to as leaders and they're abusing that power. And of course, such, such it's a, horrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's a question. Can you please elaborate on la pereza? I use people that have nothing in their heads because they are, they don't want to think. And they prefer maybe media, maybe politics to fill their heads and don't do the work. It's like, like giving uh, prepared food to the, to the rate. That's why it's... Exactly. It's not, oh, I, 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 want, I don't want to get up in the morning from my bed. No, it's, I don't want to think. I'm, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you asking me something? <laughs> oh, just, you know, do you, do you want to say anything? Do we have questions from the floor about Phyllis's work? Yes. How long does it take you to paint it? Three to four months. Wow. <sighs> That's why I showed you just, you know, the few studies that I had had images off, you know, it takes a long time to plan these. And then the execution, of course, is uh, very, very painstaking. And in the Hellmouse, in this one here, uh, I saw this when it was almost completed in the, in the, what was it, July, right? Yeah. And Phyllis said, I don't know if this, it's going to make it into the show. And to me, it looked just great. But the detail here on the, on the uh, seat, you know, the carved uh, face with the foliage, uh, it was much raw, the, you know, the highlights, the shadows, the fine lines weren't there yet. So, you know, there's a huge difference between uh, the preparatory work and then what finally, you know, is, is acknowledged by Phyllis to be perfect. There was a work in here which I thought was really great. It was called Burners, but Phyllis didn't want it in the show. She was not satisfied with it. So she really has extremely high standards for herself. Uh, so, you know, the, the detail just takes an enormous amount of time. This person here, which no doubt many of you think is a female, is actually a man. I thought it might be divine. But, uh, but I'm not sure because it didn't say. Very old photograph, black and white. 
And the Hell Mouse, did I get that right? Yes, you did. Okay. It was the Passion Plays, mm -hmm. and the <coughs> uh, the Hell Mouth was the first wagon. But they were they were much more uh, complex than that. Very big, about uh, ten feet across, fourteen feet long. They had turrets that built smoke and fire, and devils and snakes, and they were magnificent. And then the uh, the rest of the wagons that the plays were passion plays were presented in were behind them, and they went on for months, months. I thought it would be a good idea to include them. Yeah, Jesse. I can definitely tell that the whole process is probably pretty involved. But you said that you um, drew inspiration for one particular figure through a photograph. Um, but I feel like the facial expressions are incredibly um, in line with what the whole purpose of the painting is. And that seems like a very difficult thing to do from a photograph. Do you use like models as well, or? If I can get them. Yeah. <laughs> I become pretty good at composites. Yeah, okay. I just saw uh, uh, the man in the center, for instance. Um, uh, I, I knew what kind of eyes I wanted what kind of a nose I wanted, and so, yeah, that's how I do it. But I couldn't find anyone that looked that way. <laughs> <laughs> it would be really hard to find models for Phyllis. <laughs> that's my guy. <laughs> There was a time when, <clears throat> when my husband and I were young, I was able to use our body parts. <laughs> I'm now down to hands. <laughs> Alexia. The Queen of Heaven stands silent and weeping, conjuring talismans, her pure spirit and righteous power coalesce to rescue the sinner from Satan's mischief and the pit of hell. But can she do it? First sentence of Satan. <laughs> That's basically what it's all about. Contemplation. You know, and it's, mm -hmm. it is obscure and it's not literal. Mm -hmm. Did you know, where did you get the original vote, ex voto? Oh, <clears throat> well, slight historical, I did a very small piece mm -hmm. that never showed anywhere. It was done, I guess I did it for myself, with four of the images that are up there. Mm -hmm. But they were the original, they're called mass cards. They're the original huh. mass cards, and I had used, it's called Letra Set. It's this. Mm -hmm. okay. You guys know what they are, right? You put it over an image and you just... Well, line, on, yeah. It leaves diacritical marks or whatever, letters, and so mm -hmm. on, numbers. And I did the four, and they, it's been in my studio for years. But the the mass cards, they just hand it to people who go to mass afterwards? Or yeah. How does that work? I'm a, I'm a partisan, so I don't know. Yeah. What? Different prayers. They're, they're usually it's different not saints. The back. It's yeah. different saints. Oh. Different, and, and different you prayers. ask for them or you buy them? or does you, it, you, buy them. you buy them. You buy them. Oh, yeah. okay. You know, well, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, there was a time in the 90s when I was doing these giant bracelets with I a lot of those, religious yeah. iconography on them, and I think she, her image went on one of those bracelets at some point in time, yeah. so I had a yeah. few of them, man. Alexia is very versatile. She does some fabulous other things, with, uh, not two-dimensional, but jewelry. And oh, you had a series of uh, handbags that were quite spectacular. That took off from uh, made out of bowling balls. Bowling balls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have more questions. No. Uh, I yes. Have a question. Uh, Alexia, maybe for some of the students who might not have seen it, you can talk about the card that you made and, and your T-shirt. How about the pussy like? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Oh, 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 yeah. Well, I don't have a card with me. Maybe somebody I have one. <clears throat> yeah, but the t-shirt, which I made also, I'm, I would think that a lot of you have heard of Pussy Riot, mm -hmm. the feminist group in, <clears throat> in uh, I almost said Soviet Union, not too much of a difference, in uh, Russia. 
<clears throat> in February they were arrested for having uh, done a uh, art performance in the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in Moscow. And <clears throat> they were arrested, three of the members were arrested, and they've been in jail, <clears throat> they, they, they were in jail from March until, mm, well they still are in jail, in August. The government of Russia passed judgment on them as being guilty of having committed hooliganism and hatred towards religion and gave them a two-year sentence in a penal colony. So <clears throat> what happened very soon after they were arrested, there was protests all around the world for these young women. Um, they're all in their 20s. And I think that protest is probably going to continue until <clears throat> something happens to soften Mr. Putin's heart and he allows the, these women to go free and uh, maybe to even change this particularly crazy law in, in Russia um, that states that if you committed something they consider to be hooliganism, you can be thrown into jail. And that could be something as simple as, I don't know, walking down the street in the wrong kind of clothing or saying something that uh, some government official doesn't feel is proper. How about stuffing that frozen chicken up the vagina? <laughs> that probably would count. Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> I was surprised to hear that they had done that. Well, they had, they had, they, these are married couples. <clears throat> they had sex. Uh, He's mad because they were anti-Putin. Well, they're anti-Putin? Well, absolutely. They're not anti, they're not anti-religion. They're not anti the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, as a matter of fact, why I did this small protest was because um, they're, uh, song that they performed, well, the performance they performed at the church, at the cathedral, um, beseeched uh, the Madonna, the Mother of God, the Virgin Mary, to please toss Putin, you know, out of, Putin out of, out of Russia. So I felt, well, there's a connection there, although this work that I did was not done with them in mind. But, but the, the card that Alexia did has the same, well, has an altered image of the Madonna. Now she's kind of smiling, looking sideways. And it says, attention people, government steal your natural rights, free pussy riot, free yourself, Mary, Queen of Heaven, as a signature on the bottom. So, you know, it's Mary herself protesting. Yes, she is. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everybody.